Okay, well, good afternoon to all of you. Um, just a few things before I begin. Um, again, I've got some old homework that hasn't been picked up yet, so don't forget to get your work. Um, I also have uh, given you my finals week office hours. Um, <clears throat> your final exam is Monday, a week from today, unfortunately, but um, Monday nonetheless at 11.30 in the morning, so make sure you're here at the proper time. And um, I will have some extra office hours Friday afternoon. Um, actually, I have another final exam right before yours on Monday, so I'll have some extra time Friday afternoon. I'll be in a little bit in the morning, so you should have some opportunities to see me if you need to. Um, and then I have other office hours for the rest of the week, but um, those are posted up here, so please make a note of those. Also, I've just rewritten homework set numbers 9 and 10. Um, the Chapter 7 material is really last week's, so that's set 9, and the Chapter 9 material is what we're going to begin today. Um, none of these problems you're going to actually be submitting. In fact, um, early this morning I posted the solutions to these last two homework sets. So all the homework sets are now posted. Um, you're still responsible for this material, of course, but I'm just not going to have it turned in as part of your homework grade. So essentially the first eight homework sets are the ones that will determine your homework grade. Um, practically everybody scored very well on the homework, so not a problem. All right, so just a quick recap from last time. Um, we're, we're done now with Chapter 7. We're done with our discussions of entropy. That doesn't mean we're going to stop using entropy. We're, we're just done with our discussions of them. Um, the last thing that we dealt with was the concept of isentropic efficiency. So it turns out there's many ways that we're going to use entropy for solving various types of problems. Uh, but for problems that involve work, through a device that involves flow, in other words, a pump, turbine, or compressor, uh, we have this concept of isentropic efficiency. What we're doing is we're trying to find a relationship between the actual amount of work that is either produced or required by that device and compare it to the amount of work that would be, well, produced or required by that device if it were indeed an ideal process. Ideal meaning isentropic or, if you will, adiabatic and reversible. Uh, so what we would do in the solution to those types of problems is we would assume first that it was an ideal process and that would tell us that the entropy is constant through that process. So we'd use that fact in order to find the exit state. Usually we would know the inlet state. We'd know one property at the exit state. Um, we need a second property and that second property is entropy, right? So we, we note that T1 is equal to T2S I've called it. I'm sorry, T. We note that S at 1 is equal to S at 2S. In other words, the ideal um, discharge from that device, we call that point 2S. Um, knowing that property, entropy at 2S, as well as the, well, usually would be the pressure at 2S, we can then find whatever the property, whatever other property we need. Most notably, we're going to need enthalpy, right? Because it's enthalpy that will be part of our first law, which will allow us then to find the work associated with any particular process. Um, we're always going to be given, well, mostly we'll be given the isentropic efficiency. Um, so it's really a pretty straightforward process, right? You assume that it's ideal, you find what would be the ideal work, and then you apply the isentropic efficiency to get the actual work. Um, and I actually went through two example problems of this last time, right? Um, one was for a pure substance like water or R134A, I don't recall which at this point, um, where we actually use property tables. Um, to go from point one to point two. Um, but we also looked at a situation where we might have an ideal gas, where we're going to be um, you know, entering at a certain state and leaving another state. And of course, we're going to use the same methodology. But uh, the process is just a little bit different, right? Um, if it's an ideal gas, first of all, we're only interested in temperatures because um, you know, basically the specific heat cancels out of our efficiency equation. So we really only are worried about T1 at the inlet and then T2S and T2A at the outlet. Um, having that information, um, we could then find, again, the actual amount of work associated with the process. Now, we're going to continue with this type of discussion now. We're going to keep looking at problems that involve ideal gases, um, but we're going to finally look at our very first power cycle here. Okay, uh, We've looked at various heat engines, right? Well, actually, I shouldn't say various. We, we've looked at, the, let's call it generic heat engine, where we know there's a certain amount of heat input, a certain amount of heat rejection, a certain amount of work. Uh, network output, if you will. Um, but we've never really looked at a specific cycle uh, 
that utilizes the first law analysis that we've learned back in chapter five and some of this information about entropy that we've learned here in chapter seven. Um, so that's really what we're going to get into now. Now there's many, many different cycles that we're going to learn about. Granted, we can't do them in one week. Um, we're going to learn about the simple ideal Brayton cycle, and that's going to be essentially the last thing we'll cover in this class this quarter. Um, next quarter at ME302, uh, we'll talk about other types of cycles. Well, we'll look at the same, uh, well, ideal Brayton cycle that we'll start talking about today, but we'll look at the non-ideal case. In fact, we'll look at some variations of the Brayton cycle. Uh, we'll also look at what's called the ranking cycle, which is the cycle that we use to model a steam power plant. We'll look at the refrigeration cycle, um, which is basically the cycle that we use to analyze a refrigerator, freezer, air conditioner. Now, again, we have a lot of the basic <coughs> equations, at least we have the performance equations like thermodynamic efficiency or uh, coefficient of performance as that is applicable for refrigeration cycles. Um, but now we're going to look at what's inside those particular devices, if you will. Um, the first heat engine that we're going to talk about now then, and this is beginning of chapter 9, is, uh, well, it's the Brayton cycle, but that's part of a broader category called gas power cycles, which is where we're going to start. Okay, so hopefully you wrote down all this information about homework and finals week office hours. Now we begin with gas power cycles. Um, by the way, within this category of gas power cycles would be internal combustion engines, both gasoline as well as diesel engines, since they use vapors or gases, if you will. Um, there's other cycles like Stirling engines that some of you may have heard about, which would also be gas power cycles. So these are all discussed in chapter nine. Um, let me just caution you, uh, the Brayton cycle doesn't really get going until section 9-8, um, but the general discussion of gas power cycles is in sections 9-1 through 9-3. So please make sure you look at your syllabus and only read through those sections that you're required to. From chapter 9, it's 9-1 through 9-3, and then also 9-8, specifically dealing with this Brayton cycle. Um, so let's talk about gas power cycles. Um, first, let's understand that these types of cycles are very common. Okay, there's many, many cycles that are always using gases or vapors, if you will, through every portion of the cycle. Um, heat input is being added to a gas. Heat rejection is being rejected from a gas. Work is being done by a gas. Work is being required by a gas. Um, these are the nature of gas power cycles. Now, it should be noted that the substance will change. If we look at a, a real cycle, let, let's just look at a jet engine, which is the Brayton cycle that we're going to be dealing with shortly. Um, in that type of cycle, um, you'll have air that enters the engine. Um, you'll compress it. Um, you'll then add fuel to that air. Um, so now you have an air-fuel mixture, and it will have certain properties associated with it. Um, you'll burn that air-fuel mixture, and now you'll end up with combustion gases. Um, those combustion gases will then pass through a turbine, which will give up their energy, causing rotation on the turbine. And then you'll reject heat from that gas simply by exhausting it out into the environment, uh, the biggest heat exchanger of them all, right? So that would be a typical gas power cycle. The problem with those cycles is that they require an understanding of thermodynamic properties for mixtures, which we're really not at yet, right? If we have an air-fuel mixture, then you can't really analyze it as if it were a pure substance, well, because it's not, right? If you have combustion gases, well, combustion gases are mixtures primarily of water vapor and carbon dioxide. Again, they're mixtures of gases. So when we deal with the air, I'm sorry, when we deal with the gas power cycles, uh, we should understand that we really do have air and fuel mixtures or combustion gas mixtures moving throughout, uh, but we're going to make a really big simplification, and we're specifically going to talk about what we might just call air standard cycles. And the air standard cycles are really just a special case, or if you will, a simplification for the gas power cycles. In other words, we're going to assume that even though we know that we really do have a mixture of gases, um, we're just going to assume that it's only air. Okay? So what is in the air standard cycle? So air only is what we'll call the working fluid. 
Um, when we use the word working fluid, hopefully you've read about this in your book, um, this is the substance that's actually moving through the system that's ultimately providing work, right? So the air eventually will go through a turbine and provide some work. Um, so air, and only air, is the working fluid. Now again, that's not real, but this is the assumption we're going to make. It's a simplification that will give us the ability to reasonably accurately analyze certain types of cycles. Okay. So no combustion gases, no air fuel mixtures, it's air only. Um, we're also going to assume that there's no actual combustion. So no combustion occurs. Um, what we're going to assume is that we have simply a heat exchange process. Okay. So heat is added via a heat exchanger. And whenever you see HX like that, it just means heat exchange. So HX is, is a heat exchanger, right? So that's just my shorthand for heat exchanger. So there's no combustion. We're just assuming that however much energy would ultimately be liberated by combustion is the same as the energy that's being added as if it were a heat exchange process. Okay. Um, now, we're also going to assume that the exhaust from this system isn't really exhaust, okay? Um, in the real world, whenever you finish doing work, you're just going to take whatever those gases are that remain and then just exhaust them out into the environment, right? Um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to assume that however much heat would otherwise be transferred in the exhaust process, you know, just by dumping those gases out into the environment, is the same as the amount of heat that's simply transferred into the environment by a heat exchange process, okay? So we'll note here that there's no exhaust process. Okay. Um, I'll note then that heat is rejected via a heat exchanger. Okay. And what this also implies then is that the cycles that we're about to look at, uh, the cycles are going to be considered closed cycles. Now, another thing, um, uh, by the way, maybe I should give you a little more information about the idea of a closed cycle. Um, if we look at a real engine, it's not a closed cycle, okay? It, it's open to the environment, right? We're going to take some air and we're going to take some fuel and we're some, yeah. Is that a little better? Okay, so we're going to take some air, we're going to take some fuel, um, we're going to bring it into the cycle, um, we're actually going to run it through a compressor of some sort, um, we're then going to burn it, right, there's going to be a combustion process, so that's going to occur in some sort of a combustion chamber, um, and then the gases are going to come out of that and into a turbine and they're going to cause rotation on the turbine, and then it's going to exhaust. Whoops. Um, so it's going to dump out into the environment. It's open, right? You start with open air fuel, you do work, you transfer heat, you provide work, and then it just exhausts right back out. So that would be an open system. So in the real world, it would be an open system, or an open cycle, if you will. Um, but that's not our world, okay? In our air standard cycle, so in the air standard world, it's a closed cycle, okay? Um, so we have a real life cycle with different devices, right? We'll have some air that's just moving through the cycle. Um, you know, I'm not real happy with this diagram. I'm just going to start a new one. Um, all right, so we're basically just going to take some air and we're going to run that air through a compressor. So I'll just put C for compressor. Um, we're then going to go through a big heat exchanger where we're going to add a certain amount of heat. Um, we're going to come out of that heat exchanger into a turbine. 
Let's put a big T for turbine where we're going to do our work. And then we're going to assume that the environment is this big heat exchanger. We're just going to take heat out and our air goes right back to where we started, right? We started with air going into the compressor at a certain state, and we've got the same air going right back into the compressor. So uh, this is really the cycle that we're going to be looking at, OK? So one other thing that has to be noted regarding the air standard cycle, um, we're going to also simplify the way that we take our thermodynamic property data. So one other item, and you know, really, I should have identified this up above, so maybe I'll just add it up here because I do have a little more space left, and you could just add it above in your notes as well. Um, we're going to assume that air is an ideal gas with constant specific heats. And we're going to assume that it's constant specific heat at room temperature. So again, there's a lot of simplifications that we're utilizing in this particular problem, or in this type of problem. But that's the nature of these particular cycles. That's the nature of the air standard cycle. It's a simple cycle just to get us learning about the material. Now, if you want to uh, you know, go beyond this and learn more about real cycles, well, we'll talk more about more realistic cycles in ME302. Um, we'll still use air as an ideal gas, but not at constant specific heats anymore. So we'll, we'll get to more uh, you know, accurate models later in ME302, your second course. So anyway, let's go back to this sheet here. So we understand that the real cycle is not the same as this somewhat idealized closed cycle that we're going to be dealing with. Um, all right, so now let's move on. So we're dealing with a simplified cycle that only deals with vapors. Um, the vapor is air, and it's always air, and it's only air. Um, we're going to treat air as an ideal gas with constant specific heats. So now let's start to look at the types of cycles that we're going to need to understand. And it's always a good idea to begin all this with a Carnot cycle. You know, at least we understand that a Carnot cycle is this ideal cycle, right? It's a reversible cycle. It's the best possible cycle. Um, what would a Carnot cycle look like um, first from a well, thermodynamic property diagram point of view and then also from a schematic point of view. So if we want to show on a TS diagram, this has already been done, right? When we covered Carnot cycles several weeks ago, um, we saw that it was just a rectangle, right? Um, I'll put some state points, one, two, three, and four here. And we understand that we have isentropic work, in other words, adiabatic reversible work input. We also have adiabatic and reversible work output. Um, so there's the work in and out terms. Um, we also understand that there's going to be a certain amount of heat input, but this is going to occur at constant temperature, in other words, isothermal heat transfer. So this doesn't look anything different than we saw before. Um, any heat rejection is going to be at constant temperature as well. Uh, so basically, we just have the Carnot cycle that would look like that on a TS diagram. Um, it's often more useful to show this on a PV diagram. And what we'd find here is a diagram that would look more or less like this. Okay, so we have the same points, one, two, three, and four. Okay. Now, you might notice that when you're adding heat from point one to point two, believe it or not, the pressure is actually going to be dropping in the Carnot cycle while the volume increases. As we go from point two to point three, our work production process, the pressure is going to drop and the volume increases even more. Now, whenever you have a change in pressure and volume, there's got to be some work associated with that, right? Um, it's work that we previously just called boundary work. So we might note that during the heat exchange process, the only way that we're going to be able to add heat and maintain a constant temperature is if we allow the pressure to drop and if at the same time there's a certain amount of work that is being produced associated with this increase in volume. 
So that's not something that's easy to build, but that is the nature of these types of systems. Um, we'll note that from point two to point three, while work is being done, um, this is adiabatic. There's no heat transfer. Um, as we go from three to four, well, um, we'll note that work is going to be required in the same sense as when we went from one to two. There's definitely a change in pressure and volume, so there will be some work done, and there will be some heat transfer at the same time. So over here on this TS diagram, maybe we want to show more than just heat transfer from one to two and heat transfer from three to four. There's also going to be a certain amount of work output as the volume increases from one to two. So work out. And there's also going to be some work input required from three to four during that heat exchange process. Um, well, the volume is shrinking, the pressure's rising, there's going to be some work done. So I'll also show work input from three to four. Okay. I, I'm not saying that we can build such a device. I, I'm just saying that this is what the Carnot cycle would look like. Now note that work has to be done through all four processes in this particular cycle. In other words, all four of those devices are some sort of a turbine or a compressor. So let's show this now on an appropriate diagram. So this would be a schematic diagram. And I would note that whenever we have a compressor, I would show this as a trapezoid getting smaller as we go from left to right. And a turbine would be shown as a trapezoid getting larger from left to right. So that's why I've shown these a little bit differently. Um, point one is actually right here in the middle. Um, and then these two are turbines and these two are compressors. All right, so as we go from point one to point two, um, work is being done, thus a turbine, and heat has to be added. So again, we might want to show this. <clears throat> QH, heat coming in, and W out for work going out. Um, now as we go from point two to point three, we're going through a turbine. Um, no heat transfer, right? In the Carnot cycle, it's adiabatic, reversible work. There's no heat transfer here, only work. So there's more work out here. Um, from point three, we then go back into the compressor at, f and then leave that compressor at four. And again, there's going to be a certain amount of work input. Um, but then there's also going to be some heat loss, some heat rejection at low temperature. And then when we go from four back to one, well, again, from four to one, it's another compressor. There's no heat transfer, but there's definitely work. So work input. So this is what the Carnot cycle would look like. And all of this is really quite problematic, OK? In the real world, can we build something like this? Well, it's really hard, right? If we have a vapor and we add heat to it, you wouldn't expect that the temperature is going to remain constant and the pressure is going to go down. I mean, in the real world, when you add heat to something, its temperature and pressure are likely going to go up. But this is the nature of the Carnot cycle. It, it, this is very impractical uh, to create a turbine that is also a heat exchange device and that operates at constant temperature. I mean, it just can't be done. We, we can't build something like that. Um, now, to go from point two to point three, again, that's kind of impossible too, isn't it? Um, we, we can't build a device that produces work without some loss of heat, right? If there is no heat loss and this is truly reversible like in the Carnot cycle, then that's the ideal turbine. We can't build that, right? Uh, but that's the nature of the Carnot cycle. So we assume that it's a um, adiabatic turbine here. Um, and then same thing goes with the compressors, right? We can't really build a device um, that would transfer heat and provide work input and at the same time maintaining a constant temperature while the pressure goes up. I mean, those are hard to build. Um, in the real world, when you remove heat from something, um, well, the temperature is going to drop, the pressure is going to drop. And nonetheless, this is still the Carnot cycle. Um, by the way, we can call um, the turbine from one to two a isothermal turbine if you wanted to. Um, we can call the turbine from two to three uh, simply an adiabatic turbine. Uh, 
Um, and with regards to the compressor, essentially the same thing. We can say from three to four is an isothermal compressor. And from four to one is an adiabatic compressor. Now, just because we can't build this thing doesn't mean that we don't want to analyze it. I mean, the Carnot cycle still represents the best possible cycle that one could have, at least as a heat engine cycle, operating between two temperature limits. So let's look a little bit at the analysis of such a cycle. Okay. So what are we primarily interested in? Well, the thermodynamic efficiency, right? The thermal efficiency or thermodynamic efficiency is our measure of the performance of a heat engine. And these cycles now, these gas power cycles, whether it's air standard or not, these are heat engines, right? We're, we're taking some heat input and we're converting it into work, some network output. And then we're rejecting some heat at the same time. I mean, this is a heat engine. So we know that thermal efficiency, at least for the Carnot heat engine, is just one minus TL over TH. Um, and what we can do is we could just substitute a 1 and a 4 for H and L. So this would be 1 over T4 over T1. Um, it might also be noted that T1 and T2 are the same, right? Because we have constant temperature heat input from 1 to 2. Um, so we can replace the T1 with a T2, and T4 and T3 are the same, right? It's constant temperature heat rejection, so I'll replace the T4 with a T3. And one would note, therefore, that T4 over T1 equals T3 over T2 for a Carnot cycle. Now, why is that important to me? Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but let's just leave it at that for the time being. And now let's move on and we'll note that there are a couple of isentropic processes, right? Um, there's an isentropic process from four to one and there's another one from two to three. So from two to three and from four to one. So with this in mind, what are some of the things that we learned about a well, an isentropic process as it deals with an ideal gas with constant specific heats. Well, that there's a relationship between pressure and temperature, right? So you may recall that um, there's a relationship between the pressure and temperature ratios. Um, this isn't exactly the same form as the one that was in your notes from a week or so ago, um, but I have just inverted a term here and there. Um, nonetheless, P2 over P3, um, we're going to actually give it a name. This is going to be RPS. And this isn't the same as the pressure ratio, which is P max over P min. This is what we call the isentropic pressure ratio. It's the pressure ratio associated with the isentropic process in that turbine, right, from point 0.2 to point 0.3. So P2 over P3, we call this RP with the subscript S. And this is equal to T3 over T2, and then raised to the K over 1 minus K power. Now, the way this was presented to you previously, um, you had a temperature ratio equals a pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K power. Uh, I've just um, basically just fiddled with the exponents and put it into this slightly different form. Okay. Um, but this is completely equivalent to the equation we had before, the one that would have said P2 over P3. I'm sorry, T2 over T3 equals P2 over P3 to the K minus 1 over K. And this is nothing more than a mathematical manipulation of that. Anyway, we would also note further, like it says above, that T3 over T2 equals T4 over T1. So therefore, this is equal to T4 over T1 to the K over 1 minus K. Okay. And it might be noted that the same relationship for an isentropic process exists between points 4 and 1 as it did between 2 and 3, right? Um, this ratio is therefore equal to the pressure ratio P1 over P4. Okay. So it turns out that um, the isentropic pressure ratio is the same for each portion of the cycle. Okay, so therefore, I'll just note 
that P2 over P3 is going to equal P1 over P4, which is our isentropic pressure ratio. Now that's one thing that I would like to note. Um, another thing that I would note is the following, that if I go back to the equation T4 over T1 equals, and then this would be the pressure ratio P1 over P4 to the K over 1 minus K, um, I could also just simply write this as the isotropic pressure ratio to the 1 minus K over K. Okay. Now, why is that important? Well, I think we then have to go all the way back up to the top of the page here. And look, the thermodynamic efficiency for the Carnot cycle is a function only of T4 over T1, but it turns out that's only a function of the pressure ratio, well, the isentropic pressure ratio to the 1 minus K over K power. So therefore, if we go all the way to the top then, the thermal efficiency just from the very top, I guess I can't really fit them both on the page at the same time, can I? Um, this is going to equal 1 minus, and then here we have the isentropic pressure ratio, and then raised to, let's see, this is T4 over T1, yep, to the 1 minus K over K. Okay, so it turns out for the Carnot cycle, you don't even need to know what any of the temperatures are. All you need to know is the pressure ratio for the isentropic process across the, uh, well, adiabatic turbine or compressor, and you can figure out the thermal efficiency. So again, we can't build this, but it certainly gives us an easy way to compare our real cycle with the ideal cycle. Now there's one other short derivation that I would like to go through here. Um, let's go to volumes. You may recall that when we're looking at an isentropic process for an ideal gas, another relationship related the volumes to the temperatures. So I'll note here that V3 over V2, uh, by the way, we're still talking about an isentropic process from 2 to 3 as well as from 4 to 1. So here, V3 over V2, it too has a special name, RVS, and this is called the isentropic volume ratio. Okay, so the isentropic volume ratio, well again, we can relate this to temperatures for an ideal gas with constant specific heats, and we get T3 over T2 to the K over 1 minus K. Now again, this should already be in your notes from a week or more ago when we were talking about isentropic processes for ideal gases with constant specific heats. And I want to do essentially, I'm sorry, that's wrong, it's 1 over 1 minus K, not K over 1 minus K. So. That's supposed to be a 1, 1 over 1 minus K. That doesn't look so great. There you go. Now it's written a little more smoothly. Yes? How did you reverse where it says RPS? How did you reverse the X? P1 or P4? Sorry. Is it R of K? Well, I mean, our original equation said that pressure ratio, pressure ratio equal temperature ratio to the K minus 1 over K. So I, I could just, if I wanted to, I could just say, okay, P4 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K. Um, I'm sorry, it would in, be the inverse of that. So it would be K over K minus 1, right? Um, I mean, I, I could go through the whole derivation. Um, yeah, let me just do it down here. Let's call this an aside. All right, so we have T2 over T3 would equal P2 over P3 to the K minus 1 over K. Um, we can now just bring the exponents to the other side. So P2 over P3 is going to equal T2 over T3. And this would then be to the K over K minus 1. And then I can just raise this and this both to the minus 1 as an exponent. So basically, this would be T3 over T2. And then instead of K over K minus 1, it's K over 1 minus K. 
So that effectively raises this to the minus one, further to the minus one, we cancel out, and that's just to the first power. Um, so that's the basic process. And I've just played with the, um, well, I've just played with the exponents here. And did I do that right? Yeah, then I guess the last thing one would have to do would be to put it into the proper format. Um, no, that is in the proper format, isn't it? Yeah, that's all right. So that, that's exactly how it was presented, you know, up here above. So that's where it comes from. Okay. Um, yeah, if anybody wants any more input on dealing with those exponents, then just exponents, then just come see me in my office or after class or something. All right, so let's get back to this equation up above. Um, we would note again that there's a relationship between volume and temperature for an isotropic process for an ideal gas with constant specific heat. And let's just continue this then. Um, we would again note that T3 is the same as T4 and T1 is the same as T2. <coughs> so we can rewrite this as T4 over T1 to the 1 over 1 minus K. And again, we would note that this is an isentropic process from 4 to 1, so this is also equal to P1 over, uh-oh, I'm, I'm putting P's instead of these, right? This is related to the volume ratio just like it was above, so this would also be equal to the volume ratio, so that's just V4 over V1. Now that makes sense. And therefore, we could do essentially the same thing that we've done before. Um, we would note then that T4 over T1, again, just fiddling with the exponents, uh, this is now V4 over V1, um, which is the isentropic volume ratio, so R sub Vs, and then raised to, well, we're just going to bring the 1 minus K over into the other side, so to the 1 minus k power. So this applies. And therefore, we have another relationship for our thermodynamic efficiency. So therefore, the thermodynamic efficiency for the Carnot cycle, um, instead of 1 minus T4 over T1, we could also write it as just 1 minus the isentropic volume ratio to the 1 minus k. So you'll have different problems um, depending upon, well, what's given in the problem statement, I suppose. But in some problems, you'll know the isentropic volume ratio, in which case you can just use this particular relationship to find the thermal efficiency. In other problems, you'll know pressure data. You'll know the isentropic pressure ratio. So you can just use this equation to find the thermodynamic efficiency. Um, this, again, should say for the Carnot cycle, since this specifically only deals with the Carnot cycle. So this is where Blackboard would be real nice, where they can have all sorts of things open at the same time. So can't really do that here. Nonetheless, we at least know that we now have the ability to find the thermodynamic efficiency for a Carnot cycle, but we also know that this cycle is not particularly realistic. So what do we do? Is there some cycle that we could possibly build in this real world of ours that would do a good job in modeling certain types of engines? And the answer is yes, and that's what the Brayton cycle is all about. So now we begin the first realistic heat engine cycle called the Brayton cycle. Now, the Brayton cycle is used as a model um, for what we'll just call a gas turbine engine. Okay. And a gas turbine engine can also just be called a jet engine. Although here in mechanical engineering, we're not really so concerned about hanging this gas turbine engine off the wing of a jet. I mean, our purpose is not to provide thrust. From our point of view, it's really more appropriate for an electric generator. Um, almost all of the latest and newest modern uh, electric generators use gas turbine engines. Believe it or not, they're not the big clunky steam cycles like we see all over the place. They're relatively small jet engines, and in fact, um, 
I don't have this on a separate slide, but there's a jet engine. Um, this is a gas turbine engine, and it has everything in it we would expect. Um, let me see if I can kind of talk you through this, and then I will simplify it for you in some other diagrams. Um, but basically, this is the inlet, and these several stages right here up front, these are just compressors. Um, you don't compress in a single stage, you actually compress in multiple stages. Each compression gives you a slightly higher pressure and a slightly smaller volume. And if you compress in multiple stages this way, then that will maximize the overall efficiency of this design. So these are your compressors. Um, this says variable geometry compressor, although that doesn't really matter. Um, but the fact is, if you have varying flow rates, you can actually adjust the geometry of the compressor blades to improve your overall efficiency of those compressor blades. Um, next, we come through here, and this is our combustor, although I personally like to call it a combustion chamber. But it's the same idea, right? You're, you're adding fuel, you're burning it. Um, now granted, our Brayton cycle is going to be a simplified air standard cycle. Um, air is going to come in. There's not really any combustion chamber per se. Um, all we have is a heat exchanger that's adding heat at the same rate as combustion would otherwise be liberating that same amount of heat. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a second part. So you know, here's our compressor. So that's basically from 0.4 to 1. Here's combustion heat input from 1 to 2. Um, and then right here, these last several stages, um, these are your turbine blades. Okay. Um, so these turbine blades are going to be actually producing some network output, some power, and then the whole shaft of this engine will be connected to an electric generator. It's not uncommon actually to have the electric generator up front um, so that it doesn't get in the way of all the exhaust gas, which in the real world is for sure spitting out the back of this engine. Um, same thing on a jet, right? Um, this wouldn't be spinning a electric generator it would be spinning what we call a turbofan. Um, that fan sits on the front of the engine and that's what you see when you're sitting there looking at an airplane and you see the front of that jet and you know often they paint something like a smiley face or a yin yang or something on the front of it, right? Um, that's the turbofan. That fan is now spinning and it's providing a huge amount of thrust to move the airplane forward. Um, it's not the flames that come out of the back that provide you with the, the thrust, that, that's not how these types of engines work. Um, some military jets do that, but for traditional you know, passenger jets, uh, they have a big fan on the front. It's a turbo fan. It simply takes air and pushes that air at high velocity to give you the thrust that you need. Um, in fact, there's a whole nacelle that would go around this. You would call it the housing. That gives it its characteristic shape. And the turbo fan actually blows the air inside that nacelle and the geometry of the nacelle allows that air to actually accelerate so you have very high velocity air coming out the back. Again, we don't have to worry about any of that. All we have to worry about is the fact that there's some work output from the turbine, some work input to the compressor. The difference between the two is the network output and we add heat in the combustion chamber and whatever gas comes out the backside, that's our exhaust. That's what then would go into the environment or of course in our case for the closed cycle, that would simply change exchange heat with the environment and reject the heat in that fashion. Um, but this is the type of engine that we're beginning to talk about now. And we're only going to get through the basics in this class. We have, what, two days left. Um, you'll certainly go into this in a lot more detail in your next thermal class. All right, so with all this in mind, what makes the Brayton unique? How is it different? How is it that we can actually build an engine based on the Brayton cycle, but not the Carnot cycle? Well, the most important thing is that the heat transfer process takes place iso, I'm sorry, not isothermally, but at constant pressure. So we have isobaric, which means constant pressure, heat input, and heat rejection. Okay. And that's something that we can build. I mean, if you think about a typical combustion chamber, um, it's basically just a big open space, right? Um, there's essentially no possible way that we can have a different pressure on one side of that open space versus the other side of the open space. Is the pressure any different where I'm sitting compared to where you guys are sitting? No, because it's one big open space. Uh, everything has the same pressure within this, within this volume. And the same thing would happen within something like a combustion chamber, okay? The pressure is uniform throughout. Um, 
the same thing goes with our environment, right? The environment is really where we're rejecting our heat into, and the environment has a constant pressure. There's no difference in pressure uh, between the side of the engine where the brand new air comes in compared to the side of the engine where the old used up air, if you will, the one that's already produced work goes out, right? Um, the environment is the environment. There's just one constant pressure. So isobaric heat input, isobaric heat rejection is what makes this particular system unique, OK? Um, now, we're going to deal at first with just the simple Brayton cycle. And the simple Brayton cycle is going to contain just the usual devices, OK? There's going to be um, one turbine. Now there's going to be one compressor. Um, there's going to be one heat input device, which is our combustion chamber. And we're going to have one heat output device, um, which is really our environment. Okay, this is our simple Brayton cycle. There will be some modifications to this, but this is the same thing that I just showed in that diagram before, right? You have a compressor, combustion chamber, turbine, and a heat exchanger that is the environment. All right, so that's our simple cycle. We're also going to begin by looking at the ideal cycle, okay? So the ideal cycle would be the one where we assume that we have isentropic work. Now, you might note that we can't really build a device that produces work isentropically or requires work isentropically, right? I mean, that's an ideal device, and we can't build those. Um, so that kind of implies what's going to be next, right? After we talk about the simple ideal Brayton cycle, then we're going to talk about the simple but not ideal Brayton cycle. All right, so this is what we're going to begin with. So the simple ideal Brayton cycle. Um, please note, this is still an air standard cycle. Okay, we're still dealing with only air moving through this entire cycle, um, and it's always assumed to be an ideal gas with constant specific heat. Now, with all this in mind, let's go back to some thermodynamic drawings, and we'll start with a P, uh, TS diagram. Um, now, I'm going to swap the numbers. Um, I was just trying to be consistent with the way the author did this in the textbook. Um, but to be consistent now, um, we're going to let 1 and 2 represent the input and output from the compressor. Um, as we add heat, the temperature will definitely rise. That's not a problem. But it's rising at constant pressure, so I'm just going to put a little dp equals 0 here to remind us that there's no pressure change from 2 to 3. Um, then we're going to go through isentropic expansion in the turbine. So that's where our turbine work output is. Um, in fact, I really should have shown the compressor work input over on the other side. And it wouldn't hurt to show the heat input up here as we go from point 0.2 to point 0.3. Um, by the way, there's no work done from point 0.2 to point 0.3. Okay? This is just a combustion chamber. It's, it's a big open space. So there's no change in volume at all. If there's no change in volume within that space, then you can't have any work, right? No boundary work. So um, this is not a turbine. You know, when, the, when we looked at the Carnot cycle, we called it an isothermal turbine. But, but this is not a turbine, OK? This is just the heat input device. It's a big heat exchanger. It's not even a combustion chamber from our simple air standard point of view. It's just a big heat exchanger. OK, so it acts at constant pressure. There's no work associated with it, just like all the other heat exchangers we've looked at. Anyway, back to the cycle, we go back from 4 to 1. This also takes place at constant pressure, so dp equals 0. And we reject a certain amount of heat, q sub l. So this is the TS diagram. Haven't we analyzed all these types of d devices already? I mean, just last week, we were looking at the isentropic compressor and the isentropic turbine. Um, we've already looked at heat exchangers, although we don't even have to look at the whole heat exchanger. We're just going to look at the half of the heat exchanger that involves heat input to the working fluid, that is to the air. Um, we don't care about what's on the other side, what, what provides that heat. So the analysis of that heat exchanger is going to be really pretty simple. Um, we'll get to all this here shortly. All right, so this is our TS diagram. It also makes a certain amount of sense to show this on a PV diagram. 
So um, as we go from point one to point two, um, this is a compression process. So the volume is definitely going to shrink as the pressure rises. Um, now we're going to add heat. Um, but again, this heat input is going to be at constant pressure. So horizontal line. Um, now we have our expansion through the turbine from three to four. Um, uh oh, I made a, no, no, no mistake. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong diagram. Correct. Um, okay, and now we're going to go from four to one again. The pressure remains constant. So there's our cycle on the PV diagram. Again, we can show um, if we want to, you know, the heat input and the heat rejection and the work out and the work in. Okay. Now, before I even move on, maybe we don't want to use the words in or out anymore. Perhaps it would be more descriptive if we just used the type of device that that work was associated with. So let me just note that the work input is the same as the work into the compressor, right? So I'll just call that WC. And the C stands for compressor. And we'll also note that the work output, well, why don't I just call that WT? Because after all, the work output is taking place via the turbine. So we'll use, instead of work in and work out, we'll use WC and WT associated with the compressor and the turbine. And then lastly, as we're just looking at some diagrams here, um, let's just show this from a schematic point of view. So um, here, I'll even show the whole nacelle. Um, we would have a single shaft that would be connected to whatever device requires the work. Um, we would have our compressor up front. So this is our compressor, so the air is coming in at point one. Here's my big compressor, which is a whole series of really smaller compressors. Um, so here's point two. Um, now we go through our combustion chamber. Um, personally, I just like to put a big CC for combustion chamber. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to come out of the combustion chamber at point three. So compressor, combustion chamber and then turbine. So here we have all of our turbine blades and we finally leave at point four. And then I would just show this as a dashed line. Now we're only looking at closed cycles, right? So from our standpoint this could be a solid line from four all the way back to point one. Um, this really represents the heat exchange into the environment. So I'm just going to show environment here. But that's the heat exchange process. So, um, well, we've got work in to the compressor, so WC. We've got work out of the turbine, so WT. We've got heat input, QH, into the combustion chamber. And then we have heat output, QL, into the environment. OK. So this is my cycle. Now, it shouldn't really matter. If you think about it, does it really matter whether I think of this as an open or a closed cycle? I mean, if you have air going in from the environment and then finally you exhaust into that same environment, I mean, the amount of exhaust is so inconsequential compared to the size of the environment that whatever exhausts from that engine is very quickly going to meet the same thermodynamic state as you have already in that environment, right? So the environment is a big heat exchanger. Whether you want to think about it as an open cycle or think about it as a closed cycle, it's essentially doing the same thing, right? When you reject from point four, you transfer heat into the environment, you get all the way back to the state that the environment was in at point one. So this is our cycle that we're going to be analyzing. And now the question is, what would our problems look like? What are we interested in? So. First, let me just note, we've done this all before. I noted that earlier, I'll note it again. We've analyzed ideal gases. 
We've analyzed air as one of those ideal gases. We've analyzed air as an ideal gas with constant specific heats. We've analyzed compressors. We've analyzed turbines. We've analyzed heat exchange devices. We've done all this already. This is not new. Um, if you want to think about this as new because we're now taking many of the different things we've already learned and putting them into one problem, well, sure, that's new. But the individual components to our analysis are exactly the same as what we've already been dealing with. So let's just summarize the important equations. So just a brief summary of the important equations. Um, again, there's nothing new to derive for you, so let's just show them. All right, so one thing that we're interested in is the rate of heat transfer. I mean, if you think about it, this is still a heat engine, even though we're now calling it a Brayton cycle. We're interested in the thermodynamic efficiency. We, we want to know how good a job the engine does as, at turning heat into work, right? So we need the thermodynamic efficiency. So we would like to know what is the rate of heat input? We would like to know what is the rate of net work being done. So we're just going to use the equations that we've already utilized. Now, let me also note one other thing, that we're going to neglect any changes in kinetic energy and any changes in potential energy. So the equations of interest are really just simplified versions of the first law. So what would be the rate of heat input? Is it just mass flow rate times the change in enthalpy? And heat input is between 2 and 3, so H3 minus H2. And since we're dealing with an ideal gas with constant specific heats at room temperature, isn't this then just M dot times CPO times T3 minus T2? So this is one equation of interest to us, right? This is going to tell me the rate of heat input into the system. If I wanted to, I could show this on a per unit mass basis. In other words, I could just divide out the mass flow rate. And I could just easily say lowercase qh equals CPO times T3 minus T2. OK, so there's one equation of interest to us. Now, what about the net power? The net rate of doing work is just the difference between the total power produced by the turbine and the portion of that power that's required by the compressor. Okay, the turbine is your work output device, but it's connected on the same shaft to the compressor, isn't it? So not all the work that is done by the turbine will actually cross the boundary of our heat engine. Um, only that which isn't already used by the compressor is going to be the network that crosses the boundary of our heat engine and is then available to spin the generator or provide rotation on a turbofan. So this has to be known. Um, well, but isn't the turbine power um, just found, um, well, again, from the first law for a single stream steady flow process, just like above? Um, and if we neglect kinetic and potential energy and we consider the fact that these are well-insulated devices, and we're going to neglect any heat loss into the surroundings, then it's just m dot times delta h again. It's the mass flow rate times the enthalpy change between 0.3 and 0.4, so h3 minus h4. Um, and again, because we're talking about an ideal gas with constant specific heats at room temperature, we just get m dot cpo t3 minus t4, and that's how we're going to find the power from the turbine. Um, we could also divide out, if you would like, the mass flow rate. So the work per unit mass associated with the turbine is just Cp times the temperature change. Okay. And then further, we're interested in calculating the power required by the compressor. Now, again, this is going to be an absolute value because when we looked at our equations that require thermodynamic efficiency, all the work in heat transfer terms were all absolute values. So the compressor work, at least as an absolute value, is just going to be the mass flow rate times H2 minus H1. And of course, that's then M dot Cp times T2 minus T1. So there's the compressor's power. And if we wanted to, we can divide out the mass flow rate. So the work per unit mass of the compressor is just CPO times T2 minus T1. And again, this is the absolute value or the magnitude, if you will, of the compressor work. 
So this is then how we're going to find the work or heat transfer terms. So ultimately, this comes down now to the thermodynamic efficiency. So the thermodynamic efficiency, and, and this is not the Carnot cycle, right? This is for the Brayton cycle. Um, we're going to use just the general equation, which is the network over the heat input. Um, I'll just show this um, as a net power or rate of heat input. Um, of course, if we divide out the mass flow rate, we get the net work per unit mass over the net heat input. I'm sorry, the heat input per unit mass. And then we could just substitute for some of the relationships above. Um, we can just write CPO. And in fact, I'm just going to factor it out. Um, the turbine would be CPO times T3 minus T4. And the compressor would be CPO T2 minus T1. And then we divide it by CPO T3 minus T2. You can see that the CPs, whoa, uh -oh, CPs cancel. And this gives us then the thermodynamic efficiency. T3 minus T4 minus T2 minus T1, T3 minus T2. And then what I want to do is I just want to rearrange this a little bit. And I want to bring the T3 and the T2 together. So I get T3 minus T2 over T3 minus T2. Thank you. And then minus, and then here I have T4 minus T1 over T3 minus T2. And you can see that this just becomes a 1. So the thermodynamic efficiency then is just 1 minus. And then the next thing I want to do is I actually want to factor a t1 out of the numerator, and I want to factor a t2 out of the denominator. So in the numerator, I have t1 and then t4 over t1 minus 1. And in the denominator, I have a t2 and then times a t3 over t2 minus 1. Okay. Now, this can be simplified. Okay, should have just enough time to get through this little derivation. Um, let us just note that we are talking about the ideal process, right, um, for the turbine and for the compressor. Um, in other words, it's isentropic from 1 to 2 as well as from 3 to 4. So we'll note that T2 over T1 is going to equal the pressure ratio. The pressure ratio is defined the same way as it was before, P max over P min, right? This is not the isentropic pressure ratio. This is the actual pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K. Um, and we would also note that T3 over T4 is equal to the pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K, um, where the pressure ratio is just P max over P min. So this is going to be P2 over P1. It's also going to equal P3 over P4. After all, P4 and P1 are the same. P2 and P3 are the same. Okay. So if this is all true, therefore, you can see from above, if the pressure ratios are the same, and they both have the exponent k minus 1 over k, well, therefore, the temperature ratio T2 over T1 has to be the same as T3 over T4. Okay. And now I can cross multiply, and I can say that T4 over T1 equals T3 over T2. And now look what happens to my efficiency equation up above. If you plug in above, well, you can see T4 over T1 minus 1 has to equal T3 over T2 minus 1, right? So these cancel. And therefore, the thermodynamic efficiency is just going to be 1 minus T1 over T2. Now, T1 over T2 is the same as 1 over T2 over T1. And what is T2 over T1? Well, it's just the pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K. So therefore, 
the thermodynamic efficiency for the Brayton cycle, and again, this is only for the air standard, simple, ideal Brayton cycle, isn't even a function of any of the temperatures. Um, all we need to know is the pressure ratio for this cycle, and we can find the thermodynamic efficiency. So what's left now is to start looking at some example problems. And of course, I've just run out of time, so we'll get into this right away on Wednesday. Um, but the example problem is now going to use these various equations that I've just summarized. Okay? We're going to need to find the thermal efficiency. Um, we're interested in the work. We're interested in the power. We're interested in the heat transfer rates. And I'll continue this next time. Um, by the way, I will note that this material certainly can get awfully confusing. Um, not because any one individual problem is complicated, but we're now bringing multiple problems together and calling it one problem. So simultaneously, you're solving a heat engine cycle problem with a turbine problem, with a compressor problem, with two heat exchanger problems. Um, that can become awfully complicated. So uh, just take these problems slow and easy, one step at a time. Um, you might want to wait until after I've given you an example problem or two on Wednesday to start you know, doing your homework. Although you know, maybe you don't want to wait. You do have a final a week from today. So um, I will certainly give you some examples. Anyway, that's all.